turn, brethren, to Matthew chapter 7. I'll read um, the first 20 verses of this chapter, Matthew 7, uh, verses 1 through 20. Our text this evening is the first five verses of this uh, chapter. It's the uh, concluding chapter, as you'd be aware, of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. There Jesus uh, says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye per your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given. Uh, seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For what man is there of you, whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And may the Lord bless to us his own word as uh, we read it there in the Sermon on the Mount. Those first five verses then of Matthew 7 are our text this evening. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, the beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine eye, out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Judge not that ye be not judged. That uh, statement is familiar to Christians and non-Christians alike. Indeed, there are many Christians and non-Christians alike who are very adept at quoting those words in order to fend off unwanted criticism of their conduct or behaviour. Notwithstanding the sinfulness of their behaviour, many are quick to caution those who might challenge their behaviour by quoting our Lord's words here in our text, Judge not that ye be not judged. The employment of these words of Jesus in that way reflects a popular but erroneous understanding of what our Lord is conveying here. A widely accepted understanding of Matthew 7 and verse 1 is that it contains an absolute prohibition against the passing of judgment on the conduct, behaviour and even beliefs of others. 
Some go so far as to contend that Jesus' command in our text prevents all forms of judgment, whether private or public, or manner of religious toleration is uh, supported, so it's said, by uh, this text, with the result that it is said to be wrong to pass judgment on the religious pronouncements and views of others, every religion being said to contain elements of truth. It's even asserted that the prohibition against all forms of judgment extends even to the government of the church. Uh, A text being said to preclude the passing of judgment upon the conduct of the members of the church. The challenge that comes by what authority does the church or its office bearers seek to address sin among the membership of the church? Judge not that ye be not judged. In other words, what right does the church have to denounce sin, to pass judgment upon the conduct of her members? None, some say, on the basis of Matthew 7 and verse 1. It's not the business of the church, so it is said, uh, for it to uh, reflect or to make judgments about the conduct of her members. The church has no right to make such judgments. But is that right? Is that what the word of God is teaching here in our text? And the answer is emphatically no, emphatically no. The contention that Matthew 7 verse 1 contains an absolute prohibition on the passing of judgment on the conduct, behaviour or beliefs of others is erroneous and is actually damaging to the spiritual purity, holiness and well-being of the church of Jesus Christ. Matthew 7 touches upon one of the most common and destructive sins found among professing Christians. It's not an absolute prohibition on exercising judgment, uh, but it is a passage that deals with one of the most destructive and common sins found even among believers. And in all likelihood, that's a sin that concerns all of us in some measure. The sin in question involves the unrighteous, hypocritical judgment of others. Now look at this word of God in this theme, under this theme, judge not. Look firstly at the requirements, secondly at the reasons, and then finally the possibility. The command is simple enough, judge not. But what did Jesus actually mean by those words? Was he saying, as I suggested in the interruption, in, in the introduction, that we may not form or make an assessment of somebody or of something, no matter what the issue or circumstances. Uh, As I said, that's not the uh, scriptural view here. Uh, Some commentators, though, say that is exactly what Jesus had in mind. Uh, They assert that the injunction here is to be interpreted as meaning that Christians, or as Christians, Uh, We should never form an assessment of another, whether that assessment is favourable or adverse. However, in light of the context here and other passages of the scripture, that explanation is not sustainable. Notice in the verse immediately following our text, that's in verse 6 of uh, Matthew 7, that Jesus says this, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them, under their feet and turn again and rend you. But who are the dogs? Who are the swine? Clearly to avoid giving that which is holy unto the dogs and to avoid casting our pearls before swine requires the making of a judgment or assessment as to who are the dogs and who are the swine. Later in this same chapter, Jesus warns, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them, he says, by their fruits. How are such false prophets to be identified? Obviously a judgment or an assessment has to be made. There needs to be an examination and an assessment of their fruits. Furthermore, it's clear that having assessed their fruits as believers, we are to act upon 
that assessment, we are to beware those uh, who we identify as being false prophets. Uh, furthermore, for example, Paul also writes in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, uh, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Now clearly, again, a judgment of assessment is called for with respect to the conduct and life of another there. The issue to be determined is whether a brother or a professing fellow believer walks disorderly and not after the tradition which he had received from Paul. And again, that judgment or assessment is to be acted upon, namely that, uh, that one withdraws oneself from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition that they'd received from Paul. Furthermore, in Romans 16 and verse 17, Paul writes, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Again, judgment, assessments, call for. 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Again, judgment, assessment is required there in the trying of the spirits. You might also recall that Jesus himself arrived at uh, some very adverse judgments concerning the scribes and the Pharisees uh, in his own day. Uh, one simply has to uh, work one's way through Matthew 23 and uh, the repeated uh, pronouncement of woe and unto the scribes and the Pharisees uh, to appreciate that. The reality, brethren, is the scripture is full of passages that require us as believers to make judgments concerning the conduct doctrine and opinions of others. Scripture contains no wholesale condemnation of the passing of judgment, even unfavourable judgment, upon the conduct, doctrine and opinions of others. Indeed, not only does Scripture not contain any wholesale prohibitions against such judgment and assessments, in many instances it requires such judgments and assessments to be made. Without such judgments, there can be no condemnation of false doctrine. There can be no rejection of error. There can be no maintenance of an antithetical life. There can be no standing for the truth. And the consequence of that will be that heresy would flourish in the church. Every man would, in fact, do that which is right in their own eyes. There could be no discipline in the church. Lawlessness would run unchecked in the church. The capacity to rightly judge and to wisely weigh matters, to accurately assess what others are teaching, are some of the most valuable attributes that a Christian may possess. It is essential that as believers we are able to discern, make discernment, to discern between good and evil, between right and wrong, between that which is true and that which is false. Indeed, uh, notice what John declares in John 7 and verse 24 concerning this issue of judgment. He says there, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So if this is not an absolute prohibition against the making of judgments or assessments concerning others, or about uh, views, or about doctrine. What did Jesus mean when he says here, judge not, that ye be not judged? And the answer is that Jesus' concern here is with harsh, ungracious, unmerciful, high-minded, self-righteous judgments. In short, his concern is with hypocritical judgments. Rash and unsupportable judgments that are not according to truth. Judgments that are devoid of mercy, grace and love. Judgments that are driven and shaped by self-interest. Judgments that manifest themselves in a readiness to think ill of others and to attribute evil uh, motives or purpose to others. Judgments that are distorted by an inclination to magnify and highlight the faults and weaknesses of others, 
judgments that are generated by prideful spirits and which are the products of censorious critical spirits, judgments that apply one set of standards to one's own conduct but then subject the conduct of others to a much higher and more onerous standard. Now, this is what Jesus meant is evident from verses 3 through 5 of our text where Jesus speaks of and illustrates such ungracious, unmerciful, high-minded, self-righteous, hypocritical judgments. And this is made even more apparent in the parallel passage that's found in Luke chapter 6 and verses 36 and 37. In Luke 6 verses 36 and 37, we read this. Jesus is there again speaking. He says, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. And as is clear from that passage, Jesus is clearly concerned here with judgments and assessments that uh, flowed from unmerciful, condemnatory, unforgiving spirits. Such judgments uh, were common among the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day. Cloaked in a spirit of self-righteousness, the scribes and the Pharisees commonly arrived at adverse judgments concerning the conduct of others while overlooking their own significant shortcomings in respect of those very same matters. Hypocritical judgments were prevalent in Jesus' day and they remain so in the church of Jesus Christ today. And brethren, we would be naive if we were to conclude that such harsh, ungracious, unmerciful, high-minded, self-righteous, hypocritical judgments are not to be found among us. Perhaps as we listen to this, we have already contemplated some in the congregation to whom, in our judgment, uh, this uh, sermon has particular relevance. Uh, those who, in our estimation, are prone to such censorious, high-minded, self-righteous judgments. Uh, that's sometimes the tendency, isn't it? We hear sermons about these subjects and we're thinking about, yeah, that, that's, that's exactly what that man, that woman needs to hear. It's all so clear so far as we are concerned. And brethren, we do well to remind ourselves that this word needs to be first applied to our souls. That, that's where this word first needs to be applied. It's to be applied to ourselves. If we conclude that what Jesus says here is only for others, such a conclusion actually, in fact, only serves to highlight the importance of this command so far as we are concerned personally. The reality is that all of us are prone uh, to censorious, high-minded, self-righteous judgments. Uh, in a way, I think they make us feel better. They actually make us feel better. We look at others and we see their weaknesses and we can highlight their weaknesses and then it doesn't make our own circumstances look quite so dull. So this is a word that concerns every one of us. Rather than too often, we are like David in that matter where, where the Lord sent Nathan to recount to him the uh, story of the little ewe lamb that the rich neighbour takes and slaughters for his guest. Uh, like David, we, we're very quick to identify fault in others. Recall what David says in Second Samuel chapter 12 when uh, Nathan's recounted those events to him. He says, uh, with such great clarity as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Yet David was the man. David was the man that had killed the poor man's only lamb. He was the one who had dishonourably and treacherously taken the wife of Uriah as his own. Uh, David was the one who had orchestrated the death of Uriah. Nonetheless, David was oblivious to those things when Nathan comes and brings this word to him. All David could see was the glaring fault of another. 
He failed initially at least to see the application of these things to himself. It is easy uh, to identify sin in the lives of others. It's easy because there is sin in the lives of others. That's undoubtedly true. There is sin in the lives of others. But it's also true, brethren, that there is sin in our own lives. And the truth is it's much more difficult uh, for us to recognise sin in our own lives and certainly to acknowledge sin in our own lives. And frequently we're like David. We're blind to our own faults and sins. Too often we are prone to judge others, uh, including fellow believers, and we do so from a hypocritical perspective. We're too quick to identify and to seize upon the faults, real or perceived, in others. We cavalierly and with little thought attribute to others motives and attitudes which are uncharitable. As I was uh, preparing for this evening, it reminded me of the ninth commandment of the law of God. The ninth commandment, of course, concerns uh, bearing false witness against our neighbour. And if you go into the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 144, uh, where it's asked, what are the duties required of the ninth commandment? Uh, you have some very interesting statements that are made in the answer given uh, to that question regarding the bearing of false witness against our neighbour. And the answer goes like this. The duties required of the ninth commandment are the preserving and promoting of truth between man and man and the good name of our neighbour as well as our own, appearing and standing for the truth and from the heart, sincerely, freely, clearly and fully, speaking the truth and only the truth in matters of judgment and justice, and in all other things whatsoever, a charitable esteem of our neighbours, loving, desiring and rejoicing in their good name, sorrowing for and covering of their infirmities, freely acknowledging of their gifts and graces, defending their innocency, the ready receiving of a good report and an unwillingness to admit of an evil report concerning them, discouraging talebearers, flatterers and slanderers, love and care of our own good name and defending it when need requires, keeping of lawful promises, studying and practising of whatsoever things are true, honest, lovely and of good report. Uh, we, it repays, brethren, to, uh, to study uh, the uh, Westminster Larger Catechism on that subject. And the requirements of that catechism, uh, the requirements of that commandment are quite profound in terms of our relationships uh, to one another. But then too often, instead of placing a benevolent construction on the conduct of others, uh, we have a tendency to view them through clouded spectacles. And so doing, we have a tendency to misinterpret what we see and hear about others so that sometimes we even view even the most benevolent of actions with suspicion. We formulate our assessments and judgments with respect to others on the basis of unsubstantiated assumptions, with the result that we form negative opinions of others, and those negative opinions become firmly entrenched in our minds, so that everything those, that the person does or says is passed through the filter of our entrenched, unyielding negativity, with the result that everything they do is tainted uh, by that filter. No matter what they do or say, no matter how genuine their motives, our assessment of them is invariably negative. We even reinterpret events so as to make the actions of others fit within our preconceived notions of them. We do not allow the truth to stand in our way. On the other hand, though we assess others with rigour, we apply a very different standard of judgment to ourselves. So those things that we criticise in others, we actually do ourselves. In one breath, we are scathing of the conduct of others, while at the same time, 
we engage in essentially the same conduct ourselves. We see the faults of others and we're only too ready to point out those faults but we remain blissfully ignorant of our own shortcomings. I don't know about you, brethren, but at times I think our, our hypocrisy is actually breathtaking. Why, why is that? The answer lies in our remaining corruption. As a result of the fall, we have been deprived of the ability, the ability to see ourselves as we really are. We think that we always see clearly, whereas in reality we do not. And the truth is that our remaining corruption leaves us to have a particularly high regard of self. The result is that our proud hearts happily entertain false conception, conceptions of others, but we see ourselves in a very different light. In truth, that we are inclined to see ourselves as being not too bad, certainly better than the next man or the next woman. We are like the sanctimonious Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 who stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. But that's how we at times think and it's upon that basis that we uh, too often act. And it leads to censorious, hypocrit hypocritical judgments of others. And these are the judgments, these are the sorts of judgments that Jesus warns against here when he says, Judge not, that ye be not judged. In our text, Jesus provides some compelling reasons why we ought not to enter into such high-minded hypocritical judgments. Judge not, he says, that ye be not judged. There's the first reason, that ye be not judged. Some interpret this to mean whatever judgment uh, we dish out to others, uh, we can expect to receive from them uh, in the sense of like for like. So if you judge others in a harsh, censorious way, then you can expect to be judged by them in exactly the same way. Uh, now that, it's true, is highly likely. If you consistently engage in prideful, critical judgments of others and regularly highlight and critique their failings, then you ought not to be too surprised if they do the same thing to you. But that is not the force of what Jesus is driving at here. He, in fact, is referring to the fact that there is a coming day of judgment, a day in which God, through Jesus Christ, will judge all men, both the righteous and the unrighteous. And Jesus here reminds us that we too will be judged on that day. But what standard will, will apply to us at that day? And here's the point. If we render censorious judgment upon others, we too will be judged by that very same standard. For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. If ye employ uh, a false measure, uh, then that same standard will be employed by Jesus Christ in his judgment of you. If you employ a harsh, hypocritical judgment against others, then Jesus Christ will also use that same very judgment in or that same very measure in his assessment and judgment of you. If there is no grace in your judgments of others, if there is no compassion, if there is no patience, if there is no understanding, if there is no empathy, then you will not find any grace, compassion, patience, understanding or empathy in Christ's judgment of you at the last day. If you're quick to condemn then that is the nature of the judgment that you will receive at the day of judgment. 
The more severely we judge others, brethren, the more severely Jesus Christ will judge us. Now just consider for a moment what that means. Does that mean that a believer may be judged by Jesus Christ in a way that is devoid of grace, compassion, patience, understanding or empathy? No, that's not true. That God is a gracious God and he's full of compassion and mercy. That's the whole tenor of the gospel. If God were to judge us absent his mercy and grace, uh, we could never be saved. We would never have a place with him in glory. Well, what then? What, what's being driven at here? What Jesus is highlighting here is that such censorious critical judgments ought not to be found among believers. That's not the nature of the judgments that we ought to enter into. Why is that? Well, the reason for that is believers are the beneficiaries of God's extraordinary grace and mercy. Brethren, you and I, by grace, are the beneficiaries of God's grace and mercy. We've been redeemed by the undeserved, unmerited favour of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. It does not belong to the life of one who has received such gifts to render harsh, ungracious, unmerciful, hypocritical judgments upon others. Such judgments are completely inconsistent for someone who has tasted of the unmerited favour of God in Jesus Christ. But then ask yourself, what spirit ought to characterise those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Surely, what should characterise us is a spirit of humility, a spirit shaped by God's grace and mercy. It should uh, see in us a tenderness of heart, a benevolence of spirit, an absence of a spirit of pride. Within us, we should not see the uh, censorious carping a uh, spirit that should not be within us a harsh, condemning, judgmental spirit. Think of this, where would we be if the Lord applied such a spirit toward us? Recall what Jesus said at the very beginning of the Sermon in the Mount, on the Mount. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One who is poor in spirit knows and confesses their spiritual poverty. That should be us. One who is poor in spirit knows that the place that they have before God is purely of grace. They know that they're a sinner. And they know their utter helplessness. And they know that they've been saved by grace and by grace alone. As the children of God, brethren, we ought to be characterised by uh, humility, uh, by a love of the neighbour. We ought not to engage in censorious judgments of others. If we do that, it reveals that something is spiritually amiss with us. Why do we do that? Why do we engage in harsh, censorious, hypocritical judgments when we have been the recipients of the mercy of God in Jesus Christ? Another reason that Jesus gives why we ought not to enter into harsh and gracious hypocritical judgments of others uh, is found in verses 3 and 4 of our text. There we read, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? 
Uh, what the Lord here uh, sets forth, uh, in a certain sense, deliberately uh, conjures up in our minds uh, a, a ludicrous situation. The moat refers to a very small particle of wood or perhaps a splinter or one might even describe it as a speck uh, that might irritate the eye. The beam refers to a log or a plank. We're told that our brother has a moat or a small splinter or speck in his eye uh, whereas we have a beam or a, a plank uh, in our eye. And here's the absurdity. Although we have a beam uh, protruding out of our eye, uh, we think that we have the capacity and the ability and the clarity to assist our brother with the removal of the speck or the splinter that's in his eye. Now that is preposterous. Who are we kidding? Before we could possibly render any useful assistance to our brother, obviously we need to deal first with the beam that's protruding from our eye. How could we possibly conceive that we might be able to assist our brother with a small speck uh, when we are dealing with a, a plank that's uh, protruding out of our eye? And Jesus here is really saying to us, this is how it is with our hypocritical judgments of others. He's saying to us, we cannot see properly. You cannot see properly. You have a beam, a plank, protruding out of your eye. And he's saying to us, you're deluded if you think that you can assist with the removal of the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got the plank in your own. But that's, that's the case. That's what we do. We think that we can see clearly and we think that we can, in fact, give an assessment uh, of our brother's situation and the situation and his conduct. But the trouble is because of the beam in our own eye, we can't see clearly. We think that we see clearly, but we can't see clearly. The truth is, in fact, we stand in far greater need of help than does our brother with the speck. And that is how bizarre uh, and indeed out of whack our judgment is at times. Uh, at times we lose all sense of reality and perspective. Uh, but the difficulty is for us is that we don't realise it. We don't realise that we lost perspective. We don't realise that we've got a plank in our own eye. And that's why with the, uh, the plank protruding from our eye, we say to our brother, let me help you. Let me help you with your speck. We say to our brother, well, look, I can see clearly. I can help. Brethren, here is the nub of the matter. The reality is that we're not able to help others deal with the sin in their lives until we have uh, first dealt with the sin in our own lives. And often when we look at our own sins, and we see them as small, as small splinters, small specks. Whereas when we see the sins of our brother, brothers and sisters, we see them as beams. And so we render our judgments on that basis. But Jesus here is pointing out that that's not the reality. We're mistaken. We're deceived. More often than not, we're the ones that have got the beam, and the plank in our eyes. And the brother has the splinter or the speck. And with the beam in our own eye, we cannot see clearly. We cannot discern clearly. We cannot assess clearly. Brethren, we need to forget about the speck in our brother's eye. We need to deal with the whopping great log that's protruding out of our own eye. We need to deal with our own sins. We need to deal with our own sins before offering our insights into the uh, shortcomings of our brothers and sisters. If we fail to do that, all our attempts 
to rightly assess, to help, even if well-intentioned, will prove to be futile. We will assume to ourselves the uh, ludicrous image described here by Jesus Christ. It will be as though we have an enormous uh, plank protruding out of our eye and we're saying to our brother, well, let me help, I can see clearly. Now that's farcical. But it's no more farcical than the man or the woman whose own life is full of sin but who declares that he or she can see clearly the sins of others. Brethren, there is a real danger here that we grasp what the Lord Jesus Christ is actually saying, but we reach the conclusion that it doesn't really apply to us. We think, well, I can see clearly. There is no plank, no beam in my eye. And we're sure, absolutely sure, that we can see clearly. That, of course, is what the man in the uh, account that Jesus gives here thought. That is, the man with the beam in his eye thought he could see clearly. But that man was, in fact, full of hypocrisy. Brethren, is it possible that we, in fact, have sin in our lives but fail to see that sin? To appreciate the enormity, in fact, at times even, of that sin. Well, clearly that's true. Clearly that has to be the case. Uh, that was the case, of course, of David. Uh, David uh, committed great sin. But in a certain sense, David had put away those sins. He'd uh, passed on from those sins as though there were no real issues to him. He thought he could see clearly. And it's when we, we think that we can see clearly, brethren, that we are busy, busily engaged in the finding of faults with others. There's perhaps even a sense of perverse delight uh, that we, uh, when we do that. And the result is we become more exercised about the sins of others than we are about our own sins. We have a sad habit of justifying our own sinful conduct. And we find comfort in comparing ourselves to others and concluding that they are in fact greater sinners than ourselves. But then what we say and what we think about others reveals what we know and what we have experienced of the mercy and grace of God. Recall that account of uh, Simon and the woman who washed the uh, feet of Jesus with her hair. Uh, in that account, in uh, Luke chapter 7, uh, Jesus says this, Wherefore I say unto thee, speaking of this woman uh, who came and washed at the feet of Jesus with her hair, he says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, uh, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And that, brethren, is sometimes us uh, we don't appreciate the enormity of what we've been forgiven. Uh, we actually think that we've actually only been forgiven a little because our, our sins are only little. And so we love little. Brethren, if we are to avoid hypocritical judgments, 
Uh, we need the spirit of Jesus Christ to reign in our hearts. Uh, we need to grasp and appreciate that we have been forgiven much. We've been forgiven an enormous debt. Even the least of the sin- of us as sinners here tonight, brethren, have been forgiven much. And so we need to concentrate first and foremost on our souls. We need to deal with our own sins. We need to forget, forget about the speck that's in our brother's eye. And we need to focus on the beam that's in our own. It's only when we deal with that beam that we will actually see clearly to cast out the moat or the speck out of our brother's eye. It's only then that we'll be able to render a sound judgment, a judgment that will be characterised by grace, mercy and compassion. Brethren, judge not that ye be not judged. Amen. Let's uh, stand for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thy word at times is uh, very, very penetrating. It uh, touches uh, areas of our life and our thinking uh, and shows that uh, we are those of whom uh, are being spoken of in the scriptures. Judge not that you be not judged. Uh, That's not just a word that uh, is relevant uh, to everyone else here this evening, uh, save for ourselves. But this is a word that is relevant first and foremost to each and every one of us. And so, Lord, our prayer is is that we uh, might hear uh, the words of Jesus Christ this evening. It's not that we're not to exercise judgment in the Christian life. We are. But we certainly need to avoid those censorious, hypocritical judgments that so often uh, enter into uh, our thinking. Lord, uh, grant us Uh, that grace, that mercy, that compassion. The first and foremost enables us to appreciate what you've done for us in Jesus Christ and the enormity of the debt that's been forgiven to us. And in that way, that we see ourselves first and foremost as before thee. Let us deal uh, with the plank in our own eye and then we can see clearly uh, to help our brothers and sisters. Lord, uh, deliver us uh, from such censorious judgments. Uh, They are only hurtful uh, to the cause of Jesus Christ. These things we pray for our Lord's sake. Amen.